Okay, Spiritual Warfare Part 4. Uh, this will be the final part. Um, and really, it's going to be a bit of a teaching of two halves. Um, I've titled this one The Battleground of the Mind, um, because I believe this is where all spiritual warfare begins. And um, the second half of this teaching will be kind of the remedy, because as we've gone through the first three parts, I've kind of said, you know, this is what we shouldn't do. This is what we shouldn't do. This is bad. This is bad. This, this is witchcraft. This is pagan. And it, that beckons the question, well, what do we do, right? How do we pray? Um, how, how do we put ourselves in the right place so that uh, we're not overcome by the enemy? Um, just to quickly recap what we went through in part three was um, how basically what we see today is nothing new. Uh, everything that we're dealing with uh, with this uh, counterfeit spiritual warfare is nothing new. We saw real examples in the Brit Hadashah of it, all that's happened really is that it's dressed differently. It's got a new face. It's got uh, new clothing, as it were. But the, 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 it was the same problem at its core, this idea of um, not wanting to do the hard work, actually, not wanting to do the tilling of the ground to make sure that we're in the right place so that we can have this authority from the king bestowed upon us. Uh, almost wanting to shortcut it, right? I want it here, I want it now, and I want it on my own terms. Um, so we kind of went through that. So today, let, let's just get stuck in. Um, most people are under the impression that the majority of spiritual warfare occurs in the spiritual realm. And again, this is fostered by this, um, this paradigm, this ideology of good versus evil, and there's demons under every stone, and you're this warrior, and you need to go out and you need to bind the demons through your own authority. Um, and you, you hear some really wonky stuff, actually. You'll hear stuff that, you know, you're, you have your fleshly man, which is here on the earth, and then you have a spirit man up in the heavenlies. Um, and we haven't really got time to kind of go through that. But again, where do we get this, these ideas from? Um, and what, again, I don't want to downplay the spiritual realm. Are there angelic hosts? Yes. Are there demons? Yes. But um, like I just said in this introduction, I believe that actually the battle starts right here in our minds, uh, as opposed to the spiritual realm. Does the spiritual realm, realm have a facet in this? Absolutely. But I think what we've done, again, we're focusing all the attention on the darkness, right? Focus on the demons, focus on this, focus on that, rather than actually, you know, starting from us and then working out. However, most fail to see that it begins in the mind. And again, we're going to look at real scriptural accounts to, to show this, okay? Um, I mean... Let's, let's recall the story with Elisha and his servant. Where, where did Elisha succeed and the servant fail? It was all up here and it was to do with fear. Elisha's servant was fearful. He was fearing man and the situation, whereas Elisha feared Elohim. And that gave him complete shalom and stillness, though what was going on around him. And again, so it, it was all in the mind. As we've seen, the enemy preys on what's already inside of us. He, there's things inside of us that the enemy uses to his advantage. And we're going to expound on this idea uh, moving forward now. Uh, but again, this is why I wanted to do this series in this feast, in, in Unleavened Bread. Because again, we need to get rid of what is not of Elohim that is inside of us. Because if not... If it's not of Elohim, it's fair game for the adversary to, to wreak havoc with. In James 1 verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is enticed, I am enticed by Elohim. But Elohim is not enticed by evil matters, and he entices no one. But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. 
Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. Do not go astray, my beloved brothers. Now, this is to do with sinning, right? This is to do with the flesh nature versus the spiritual nature. However, I believe this principle is especially true in regards to the battleground of the mind. It, this idea of we have, uh, so in the sinful analogy, we have things inside of us. We have these desires. And it's these desires that make us lust after uh, sinful things. Again, in the spiritual warfare kind of sense, in the battleground of the mind, there are things inside of us. And it's those things that lead us astray. So it, like, for example, this paradigm of good versus evil, demons under every stone, it makes you go astray. Um, we have, you know, the idea, the way that modern spiritual warfare has been taught in the sense of that to, to combat, to, to fight in the spiritual realm, people are being taught to usurp the throne and to speak evil of esteemed ones, like we saw in Jude. Uh, you know, by my power, by my strength, I, 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 I bind, I loose. And actually, no, we're being taught to usurp the throne. So this is what I'm, I mean. We've got these desires, as it were. We've got this leaven inside of us. We've got these things in our minds, in our hearts, that actually prevent us from seeing straight. And this is how the enemy is able to, to actually... Um, to, to hamper us. Um, again, like, like I said, we're not playing from the rule book of Elohim. The majority of people are playing right from the enemy's handbook and putting a God sticker on it. The enemy can only tempt you with what is a temptation to you. Okay? So uh, if you're an alcoholic, he'll tempt you with alcohol, right? If you have, I don't know, uh, lust of the eyes problem he'll tempt you with things that you find pleasing to the eyes um, if you're a glutton he'll tempt you with food right on and on it has to be a temptation to you however due to our fallen nature there are many areas in which we all falter in so i've put here things like pride self-sovereignty fear being subject to emotion so being ruled by our emotions as opposed to just feeling them uh, misreading situations so this little list here, we all suffer from this, all of us. And then add to that our, our particular uh, weaknesses that we all have, right? Some people are strong in some areas while others are weak in said area. So you can see already there's a whole host of things that the enemy can really play on, um, on top of all these things that we all share, such as pride and self-sovereignty. So let's look at Yeshua. Um, then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tried by the devil. I planted this seed in one of the earlier parts, but has anyone actually ever thought, how was Yeshua tempted? In the Because we've got to remember, Yeshua was a man. He, he came as a man. As Curtis would say, he didn't cheat. He, Hebrew says he had to be tempted and tried like all of us so that he could be a compassionate high priest. So this beckons the question, how did the enemy uh, tempt Yeshua? Like I said on the previous slide, the enemy, the enemy will only tempt you with what is a temptation to you. So what could the enemy use to try and get to Yeshua? And most people haven't thought of this. They don't really, like, how was Yeshua being tempted? And after having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the trier came and said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, command that these stones become bread. So first here, we have the flesh. He's hungry. He, this is the lust of the flesh. And here, if you are the son of Elohim, I would say this is the pride of life. Yeshua knew who he was. Yeshua knew who he was. And what's the enemy doing? He's saying, if you really are the son of Elohim, Yeshua knew he was the son of Elohim. Can you see how the enemy is using that knowledge, which is a truth, by the way. Was Yeshua the son of Elohim? 
Yes. So the enemy is not lying. The enemy is using a truth and he's trying to get through to Yeshua. And he's saying, command that these stones become bread. You know, use your power, your authority for self gain. Right. Do you see what, uh, what's going on here? But he answering said, it has been written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah. Yeshua knew the scripture. And not only that, he understood the true interpretation of it. He had 11 free interpretation. And this will become more evident as we go through. Then the devil took him up into the set apart city and set him on the edge of the set apart place and said to him, if you are the son of Elohim, throw yourself down. For it has been written, he shall command his messengers concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against a stone. See, the enemy is playing on the fact that you sure is the son of Elohim. It, again, this is pride of life. Show how, sh go on, show me who you are. Show me if you truly are the son of Elohim. Put, give, you, bring glory to yourself. But it, again, do you see how the, the enemy is really cunning here? He's really cunning. And not only that, he's trying to get to Yeshua, his weakest point, at the end of a 40-day fast. Yeshua said to him, it has also been written, you shall not try your, Yah, your Elohim. So you can see the enemy is using scripture and he's twisting it. He's twisting scripture because, look, these scriptures are true. The, the, these are written in the Psalms. And so what the enemy is doing is he's twisting scripture and trying to get through to Yeshua through this, are you the son of Elohim? But Yeshua, he understands the, the correct interpretation of scripture. He has 11 free understanding of it. And this is how he's able to say, you shall not try your Elohim. He understood that should he have thrown himself off the edge of the temple, he would have been trying Yah. So he understood the, the, what scripture said. Again, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the reins of the world in their esteem and said to him, all of these I shall give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, go Satan, for it has been written, you shall worship Yah your Elohim and him alone you shall serve. This is where you really get what Hasatan was doing. Notice, all these I shall give you, all the kingdoms of the world, right? Now, if Yeshua truly knew who he was, which he did, Yeshua would have known that eventually these kingdoms, at the correct appointed time, would be given to him. And what's the enemy saying? He's essentially saying, I can give you these now. You don't have to go through your suffering. You don't have to, to die. You don't have to be severed from the Father while you're on that cross. He's given him a shortcut. Take matters into your own hands now, is essentially what the, the, the enemy is saying. Use the fact that you're the son of Elohim and, and, um, and take it now. So again, like the, the, the enemy is... Um, He's playing here, not only to the lust of the eyes, because he's showing him all the kingdoms, right? And I mean, what did he do with, you know, Eve? She looked at the fruit and it looked good. And the enemy is showing him everything. And it's like, all this I can have. And he's playing to the pride of life. Now, what three things have I mentioned? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is what John in First John speaks about. This is the, and as I'm, I'm going to put forward, that these are the only three avenues that the enemy can get to you with. And he'll use these, at, notice that all those three things will play on a particular sin, a particular weakness of yours. And, you, and the enemy, very craftily, he's, he's catching you sure at his weakest point in the flesh and then playing on the fact that he is the son of Elohim. And he's basically showing, show me your power. Take matters into your hands. Show me that you really are the son of Elohim. Then the devil left him and see messengers came and attended him. 
I hope you can understand that even Yeshua was tempted. Now, the, the crime is not in being tempted. The crime is in giving into that temptation. And here we see Yeshua overcoming. Why? Because he understood the scripture and he knew who he feared. He feared Yah Elohim. Let's look at the battleground of the mind, because that's exactly what was happening to Yeshua, right? He, he was, the enemy was playing on him. He was playing, and it all started up here. It all started here and then manifested into action. We're going to put ourselves in Peter's shoes. Um, we did something similar to this, actually. We went through Judas' last unleavened bread, but I think we really need to remind ourselves of what was going on in the disciples' minds. Matthew 16, 15, he said to them, And you, who do you say I am? And Shimon far answering, said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living Elohim. And Yeshua answering said to him, Blessed are you, Shimon bar Yonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in the heavens. And I also say to you that you are Kephar, and on this rock I shall build my assembly, and the gates of Sheol shall not overcome it. From that time, Yeshua began to show his taught ones that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer much from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and to be raised again on the third day. So you, you got to remember, what did the Messiah mean to Peter, right? They were waiting for the Messiah to come and overthrow the oppression of Rome. And Yeshua is saying, well, hold on, guys. Actually, I need to be killed. And Kephar took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Be kind to yourself, master. This shall not be you. But he turned and said to Kephar, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for your thoughts are not those of Elohim, but those of men. So Peter, with all good intentions, he, this was actually coming out for him caring for his master, right? He's not doing it to be a willing adversary. But because... Peter did because Peter had this messianic leaven, right? He was expecting Yeshua to overthrow Rome. It, it it didn't go in his mind, and Peter, with all good intentions, actually ended up being an adversary to the truth. The truth being that Yeshua needs to suffer first before he can be glorified. Matthew seventeen, and after six days, Yeshua took Kephar and Yaakov and Yohanan, his brother and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as the light. Now, so remember what Peter's idea of Messiah is. He's expecting the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. And that's not a false idea, because this is what we're waiting for, right? And we have the beauty of hindsight, of being able to see, of, to see oh, well, he had to suffer first. But they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. And, um, you know, bear in mind, they had the ultimate teacher. They had Yeshua. They had the son of Elohim as their master. And even then, they still couldn't get that he had to suffer first. So I guess, you know, don't beat yourself up too much when you don't see things straight away. Imagine how he would have felt as he watched his master let himself be arrested. Think about that. He's seen that only three disciples got to see the transfiguration. And Yeshua literally let himself get arrested. He didn't fight. He even told Peter, put your sword away. How else is the scripture going to be fulfilled? Now imagine saying that, and Peter's already got an idea of how the scripture is going to be fulfilled. This is his paradigm, his uh, his uh, theological end times paradigm, as it were, because to Peter, that's what it was, the end times. It was all being completely shattered in front of him. Imagine how that, like, it, it, he would have been suffering major, major cognitive dissonance. Why did Peter even deny Yeshua? Why? We know that he did, but we don't, know, we don't ask ourselves, why did he deny him? why we always think that it was because he was embarrassed as it were or that he didn't want to get arrested too 
Oh, you, you know, because remember, Yeshua, he's watching Yeshua being interrogated by the high priest, da, 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 and maybe there is some truth to that. But why would Peter, I think it goes deeper than that. Have you ever considered that Peter was actually wrestling with whether Yeshua was the Messiah or not? Remember, Peter's end times theology, his messianic theology, has just been completely destroyed in front of him. Think about that. I believe that was the real reason why Peter denied Yeshua. He was genuinely wrestling with, is this the Messiah? What is going on? What's going on? This makes no sense. The only saving grace he had is that Yeshua told him what would happen ahead of time. We know that Peter eventually repented and overcame. Why? Again, we know that he, he repented and overcame, right? We know that. But why? What happened in his mind? What did he do? Why did he overcome? Messiah, first of all, Messiah had told Peter ahead of the curve what would happen. So I believe this would have greatly bolstered his belief, his faith. Messiah told him, you're going to deny me, Peter. You're going to deny me. He'd also told him, by the way, Peter, I need to die. So do you think that maybe while Peter is wrestling with this idea, he's thinking, hang on, he predicted that I, I was going to deny him. Maybe the other bit is true as well. Maybe. Peter stuck it through, and he didn't make any rash decisions, unlike Judas, who ended up killing himself. I mean, sure, Peter lost the battleground of the mind, but he didn't do anything rash, if that makes sense. Uh, when you read the gospel accounts, you realize that the, the disciples banded together. And I really want to highlight that. He didn't remove himself from the discipleship. He, he stayed with those that had walked with him as brothers. Now, Judas, he just completely lost it and he took matters into his own hands. Peter never removed himself from the battle nor from the disciples. He wrestled with Elohim. That made him Yisrael, right? Why, why was Jacob renamed Yisrael? Because he wrestled with Elohim and he overcame. And this is exactly what Peter did. He, he, he stuck it through, even though his whole paradigm had just completely been smashed to smithereens. There was nothing of the old paradigm left. Now, this is interesting because now that the old paradigm is gone, what is there room for? For maybe for the truth to be built up in him? Do you think it took Messiah to be killed and resurrected to destroy that old leaven that he had and then to build on it anew? The crime is not the struggle. The crime is to remove yourself from the accountable position and from the struggle altogether. That's called cowardice. Cowardice. A Look, we all struggle. We all, Yeshua struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane. But wh where did he not go wrong? He said, not my will, Father, your will. The crime is not to struggle. The crime is to remove yourself or to take matters into your own hands. This is Judas removed himself from the accountable position. He, he left the disciples. Let's look at ourselves. Let's put ourselves in Judas's shoes. Now, everything we're going to go through with Judas also applies to Peter. So bear that in mind. You're a zealot eagerly awaiting the arrival of Messiah and are willing to do anything to hurry the process along. Uh, the Zealots were a faction within ancient Judea, and they were happy to incite war with the idea that Messiah can then come and help them out. One day you hear of a rabbi that is doing great miracles, such as has never been done before. You go find that rabbi to listen to him teach, only for him to say, come follow me. Which, by the way, is the greatest honor in a Hebrew society, to follow in the footsteps of a rabbi. By the way, this was the very thing that would have been denied them. These were the 
um, these were the, the, the rejects of the Sanhedrin and of the Pharisaic and uh, of the Pharisees. Now notice as well that Yeshu did miracles that uh, the ancient Pharisee, they taught that only the Messiah would do. So you're telling me this, uh, this rabbi that's doing the messianic uh, miracles and now he's asking me to follow him? No wonder, of course I'll drop everything. Because of this great honor, you at once drop everything and follow him. You begin to witness your teacher performing miracles that you know only the common Messiah will perform. It was taught that there were three miracles the Messiah would do. Uh, heal, um, a, a, deaf, a, a, deaf and mute, uh, a deaf and mute man, to heal a blind man from birth, and to cleanse an Israelite leper. Because in the laws of leprosy, the laws of leprosy are there. The only leper that's being cleansed uh, in, in the Tanakh was actually a foreigner. Your teacher even gives you the authority to cast out demons and perform miracles. I think sometimes we forget that Judas was part of the 12, right, at this point. He went out with his partner and cast out demons. I mean, if wow. Ultimately, you believe that your teacher is the Messiah. You start telling yourself how lucky you are and amazing it is that you are a student of the coming Messiah. You can imagine the now you're witnessing the, the seeds being planted. Pride of life is now kicking in. I'm going to be, I, I'm a t student of the Messiah. You could easily get puffed up with that. The disciples were fighting over who was the greatest. Why? You start dreaming of how he will overcome the Roman Empire while you are at his side. Because that's, that's what they were waiting for, right? You, you read, after Yeshua uh, resurrected, go read the first chapter of Acts. What do, the, what do they say to Yeshua? Is now the time that you give the kingdom back to Yisrael? Even after he resurrected, they're still waiting for, for the Messiah uh, to, to set up the kingdom. They, they just, it was, yeah, it was that deeply ingrained. One day your teacher tells you that he has to die. Naturally, this shakes you, but you shrug it off as you know that your teacher has a habit of speaking enigmatically, right? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Most of the people that followed him freaked out and left. Just over a week later, he says it again, this time saying he will be raised up after three days. You're deeply grieved. Has it all been for nothing? Has it all been for nothing? What do you mean you're going to die? What about my position in the kingdom? You can see where the pride of life is really like taking hold. You cling on to the hymn saying he will be raised after three days, telling yourself that he is trying to teach us a lesson in his usual enigmatic style. There's many instances throughout the Gospels where the disciples just didn't understand what he was trying to say to them. And then, you know, a while later he explains it and they go, ah, of course. So you, you, you cling on to that. They, he's just been his, you know, enigmatic self. A while later, he says this. Yeshua said to them, Truly I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem, you who have followed me in the rebirth shall also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Whew! My master is back to his usual self again. Great! My little delusion is back on track. Not only that, I will help rule with him. I get to be one of the judges of the 12 tribes of Israel. You can see the pride really, yeah. However, shortly after, your teacher tells you that not only that he must die, but he must be crucified. So this isn't just a normal death. This is crucifixion, the most shameful way to die. We always think of the, of the physical pain when we think of crucifixion, uh, people back then were not scared of pain. 
Th these were like rugged, fit people. They weren't scared of pain. You remember, men, a lot of the men and the women would have been used to the idea of war. They would have seen people being publicly executed. So they weren't squeamish. But what, what did matter to them was the shame. We, we've lost this because we're not in an honor and shame society. Crucifixion was reserved for traitors and was the most shameful way to die. It, it, you, we can't even begin to fathom what being shamed means. That shame would have gone to Yeshua's disciples. So Judah, you can imagine Judas really freaking out. By the way, everything we've just gone through is true for Peter as well. But Peter had the... He, he, he had one more thing that Judas didn't, and that was the transfiguration. Put yourself in Judas's shoes now. You've given up everything. You've witnessed miracles, even performing some yourself. You thought you would witness the overthrow of Rome. You thought you would be part of the ruling elite of the Messianic kingdom. And it would all be for nothing. Judas would have felt that Yeshua had betrayed him. I've, what do you mean? I've just given up all this time following you around for this? By betraying Yeshua, Judas would have actually felt he was doing everyone a favor. If you truly are the Messiah, nothing I can do can prevent you from being the Messiah. If you're truly the Messiah, you'll get out of this and you'll overthrow it. Remember, Judas is expecting for Messiah to overthrow Caesar and put the kingdom back in Israel's hands. So in Judas's mind, I'm doing, this is a false teacher. And if, he, if he's a false teacher, I've, I've helped everybody out. If he's not, well, then I was part of uh, proving that he wasn't. Judas betraying Yeshua would have been his final test to see if Yeshua truly was the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Judas would have actually thought he was doing the work of Elohim by what he did. All because of a preconceived theology. And funnily enough, a preconceived end times theology. Not only that, he would have thought that Elohim blessed him in his endeavor as even the high priest paid him for the deed. He was paid 30 shekels of silver. And that's, um, it's, I'm trying to think how, many, how, how much it, that is in wages. It's a few months wages, shekels. There's, um, there's two ounces to five shekels. And two ounces is 28 days wage. So think of it that way, 28 multiplied by six. So it's essentially six months work. Blessing, not only do I get to prove whether this is the Messiah or not, I don't have to work for half a year. How was Judas technically incorrect in his doctrine? Technically he wasn't. The conquering line of the tribe of Judah that will reign over the whole earth is something that we are still waiting for. We're still waiting for that. So he, Judas wasn't wrong in that. He was correct in what would play out because we're waiting for the same thing. However, he was incorrect in how it would play out. They hadn't, again, um, this is, it, it, He's taken scripture and they've built their own idea of how it's going to play out. Never did they consider, well, actually, Messiah needs to suffer. So Judas was correct in what he would, would play out, but he was incorrect in how it would play out. And remember that the messianic theology is an end times theology. They were waiting for the kingdom. They were waiting for the messianic, for the millennial reign. So... This is why I get a little worried sometimes when people have their end times theology all figured out. I mean, we're told several things, right? We know there's 
there's going to be there's going to be famine like re, look at the four horses of revelation right it tells us certain things you know there's going to be inflation of food prices we know there's going to be some death you know there's certain things we know but we don't know the details we don't know how it's going to play out Judas had his theological ducks all in a row and he was technically correct on his doctrine <laughs> He knew how it would play out to the point he's willing to betray the person he's invested the past, however long the ministry was. He'd invested all that time and effort into Yeshua and he was willing to betray him because of him knowing his theology. Does that maybe uh, explain as to how brother shall deliver up father and daughter shall deliver up mother and brother will deliver up brother i believe that this is going to be a key aspect and yeshua was giving that statement within the believing body he wasn't saying the romans are going to turn you in he was saying brother is going to turn you in mother father think <laughs> this is serious guys and it will all be because the theology will be correct, the what, but the how. They'll have painted it all in their minds. This literally prevented him from seeing what was happening in front of him. This is why I worry when people have their end times theology all figured out. Look, yes, we should look at it. Yes, we should study it. And we have been given some things that we know are going to happen. So that when, when end times do really kick in, we'll be able to go, oh my goodness, it's really happening. But we've got to be very careful to not paint a lovely, pretty picture of how we think it's going to play out. This is why I say to people, we need to get, for example, with end time, we need to get rid of this end of the world, Mad Max, you know, post-apocalyptic scenario, because Yeshua says they're going to be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. In the in the in the day in the end times, you can't do that in a post-apocalyptic scenario. Anyway, I digress. Ultimately, leaven will cause you to create Elohim according to your own image. Judas had created Messiah to his own image, so that when Yeshua did what he had to do, it. It, it, it contradicted the image of Messiah that Judas had. And this is exactly what also happened to Peter. Peter and Judas would have had the same leaven. In fact, all of Judea and Israel would have had that leaven. And again, technically it was correct, but how it would play out, different story. Again, so, you know, again, Let's be careful of not having our theological end times ducks in a row because we'll create end times to our own image. And when the end times really kick in and they don't match up that image, do you think that maybe we could be deceived? How often have you been sure of your doctrine? Like really sure, really, really, really sure. I have, and then I've been proven to be wrong. You've only got two options when that happens. Either you dig your heels in and go, nope, and you reject the idea, or you allow the Ruach to do the work. And this is where you get the difference between Peter and Judas. Judas, his paradigm got challenged, and he dug his heels in. Peter had his paradigm challenged, and he wrestled with it. He stayed in there. He stayed in the discipleship, and he won eventually. How often have you found out to be wrong in those things? Did you feel like a hypocrite when that occurred? This is particularly, um, you feel particularly convicted when you smashed other people over the head with it. <laughs> you know, you go around saying, this is the way, and then you found out you're wrong. So, oh dear. <laughs> Did you have good intentions all along? Yeah. Absolutely. We, we go around bashing people over the head with it because we want them to know what we know, right? D did Peter have good intentions in saying, Master, Master, don't say this about yourself? <laughs> Absolutely. 
little did we know we had created Elohim in our own image. When you, when, when you really boil it right down, we've create, when we think we know it and we turn out to be wrong, we've created the word in his own image. We've adulterated that word. Little did we know we were an adversary to Elohim. Hmm. You think you're going out doing the right thing, and in fact, you're, being, uh, uh, you're going against the truth. You're going against his will. And you're doing it all with great intentions. What were Peter and Judas having to wrestle with? I think I've made that point clear. It was their preconceived ideas of what scripture said. And again, the what they were correct with. It was the how it would play out. When Yeshua and events didn't match up to their expectation, things started going south in their minds. And this is where the battle starts. This is where the battle starts. All because of how they've painted their picture. The same thing can occur with our preconceived ideas to good behavior. And I thought here, are, okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, we fall foul of creating our own standard of righteousness. And what I mean by that, we go, well, this is right, this is wrong. And especially when it's in matters to do that are not really spoken of in Torah. What's really interesting is that the battleground of the mind for both Peter and Judas involved their leadership. It actually caused them to question their leadership and to go against, in the case of Judas. Well, Peter did it as well, right? Don't do this to yourself, Master. Don't do this. And he says, Peter, you're being a stumbling block. You're coming against me. And you don't even know it. But it's interesting that their leaven, this battle, it was challenging the, the very authority put over them. Interesting. What's been one of the key themes that we've seen in this series? Authority. True authority or our own authority, which leads to usurping. Notice the link back to authority and usurping. Yeah. I've never seen this before. That actually their battleground caused them to challenge the authority. When someone's leaven is challenged, they will quite often come against the leader or the fellowship. It usually is the staggered effect. So let's say someone's leaven is challenged and they, and they dig their heels in, right? They do a Judas. They dig their heels in and they don't let go. They'll come against the leader and then because whether the fellowship stay behind the lead, if the fellowship are behind the leader, well, then that individual will go against the whole fellowship, if that makes sense. or they'll create factions within a group. So they'll say, oh, well, look at what so-and-so has done. And they actually start getting people onto their side. And I've put here, like, at the very least, at the very least, they will always come against the one exposing that level. Every single time. That's the, that's the minimum. The minimum. So let's just say, I don't know, um, Bob goes, you know, Bob has offended Joe. And actually... Joe takes that to the leader and says, well, Bob's offended me. And the leader says, well, actually, I'm sorry, but Bob's in the right here. Do you, do you see what happens? The, uh, this individual here, now, he, not only is he against the one offending him, he's against the one supporting him. This is usually preceded by trying to get others on one side. This being done under the guise of emotional support or scriptural truth. So again, let's go back, you know, this guy is going against the leadership and he'll be, or, or an, another individual, it doesn't have to be leadership, but just anyone that's offended them. They'll then start going round and going, well, can you believe they did this? Look at what they did to me. You know, playing the, playing the, uh, you know what I mean. And they'll do that to get support. And then that when they come against the person, they'll say, well, this is what scripture says. Don't you know? Powerful. This is one of the main ways that Lashon Hara begins. 
I hope you can see the stages in this. All because, all of this, because someone's level getting challenged and the person digging their heels in. And in essence, what they're doing is being a Judas. We think of Judas as being, when we call someone a Judas, we think of them betraying you, right? No, let, let, let's, let's bring it right down. It's when they dig their heels in. Hmm. All of a sudden, being a Judas is a lot easier than we realize, right? This is why Matthew 18 is so, 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 so important. The whole process is designed so that Lashon Harad doesn't occur. It's also designed to, uh, to protect the dignity of both parties, right? Right, so we must not let bitter roots take hold in our hearts and minds. So I'm going to bring this back to Judas. Judas, when Yeshua said to him, I need to die, and not only that, I need to be crucified, Judas lost it. And rather than dealing with the issue, rather than going to notice none of the disciples, we don't have a record of any of the disciples going up to Yeshua and go, can you explain what you said to us? It's nowhere. We read it in other places where, you know, Yeshua will give a parable and the disciples pull into the side later and say, Master, can you explain that parable to us? We didn't quite get it. Why didn't they do that when Yeshua said, by the way, guys, I need to be crucified? Why? Because they were digging in. They weren't letting go of their leaven. And Judas, this is, and, and Peter, that, that, that bitter root, rather than going to the master and saying, I don't get it, please tell me. They just kept it inside, they kept it inside, and they kept it inside. What do you think happens? When bitter roots take hold, emotions get attached to them. They get attached. They start, uh, roots start coming out and taking hold of our very heart. And we attach all these emotions to them. These begin to shape how we view events and even people. You can see it quite clearly in Judas because Judas, he allowed that bitter root to go down. The, that, that bitter root then took hold. And you see it. Um, you see that now, whenever he would have been looking at Yeshua, there would have been that thing in the back of his mind. I don't think you're the Messiah. You know when the, the woman uh, took the expensive perfume and poured it over Yeshua's feet? And what does Judas do? He says, ah, oh, that could have been sold for so much, so, so much, and we could have given that to the poor. Self-righteousness right there. But what, do, you, do you think that maybe the fact that Judas had already started to wrestle with Yeshua being the Messiah, that that could have sparked it? Judas didn't just wake up one day and go, oh, crap, he's not the Messiah. It was a build-up, and he never dealt with the issue. He never dealt with the issue. So from that moment that the root starts taking hold, every time he sees Yeshua, he's going to be viewing it with a skewed idea. We begin to read things into situations that have no basis in reality. This is... A really good way of explaining this is, um, let's say you get offended by someone and you don't deal with that bitter root. You don't deal with it. Every time you start seeing that person, what do you do? Oh, look at what they're doing. Oh, da, 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 da. And none of it is true because you, you, you started building your own reality around this person all because you allowed a bitter root to take hold. You didn't do Matthew 18 and go, you know, excuse me, but... This is what I'm struggling with. Is it true? Please tell, me, tell it to me from your, your side. I hope people see what I'm trying to get at here. We begin to shape our reality of emotions and start making movies in our own minds. Making movies in our own mind, it's a French uh, proverb, not proverb, it's a saying. Tu fais des films dans ta tête. It's when you, you, um, you, know, you, you completely misread a situation and you get all crazy over it. But notice that when bitter roots take hold, emotions get attached to them. And then that means that the reality we built is actually based off emotions and things that we're, you know, the battleground of the mind. 
we lose it. The, the easiest way is when someone offends you and you don't take it. And that then what happens? You start building up resentment. You start watching the person and every little thing that they do, you read into it. And you go, look at what they're doing. And then you start making up these, oh, well, you, you start putting motives to their actions. And you've never actually took it to them. Just because we feel it or think it doesn't mean it's actually true. It could be, but it couldn't. It, it, do you know what I mean? This, this, is, this is just what you think. And again, this is why the Matthew 18 process is so, so important. You know, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're in the right, actually. And this is why the Matthew 18 process is, is the way it is. Because just because you're offended doesn't mean that you've actually, you, you've got a reason to be offended. Maybe you, don't, maybe you don't have all the information. Maybe you don't know what's going on in the background. Maybe it's exposing something in you. By the way, this building our own reality, can you see how the enemy can then prey on that? If you're completely losing the battle, you, 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 the enemy doesn't even have to do anything. Like, he doesn't actually have to do anything. We just do it all by ourselves. And that's what happened with Judas. We, okay, let's look at bitter roots a bit more. We don't deal with bitter roots. And the only reason we don't deal with them is because we're afraid of having to see them for what they are. I genuinely believe that there's a part inside of us that doesn't want to look at it. And look, I'm speaking from experience, guys. I'm guilty as charged. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, a, I'm not your holy man. It's easy to point the blame on a situation or person rather than on something that could be occurring within our minds and hearts. We blame, we, so we start putting a face to a problem, if that makes sense. We start putting faces onto our problems, thinking that a person or a situation is the issue, when in fact all these things are doing is exposing something within us. So a, a really easy one. Let, let's look at um, self-righteousness, okay? We, let's say we're self-righteous. We, we build our own standard of righteousness. And then someone doesn't, um, someone doesn't match up to our expectations. What do we do? We start going, well, look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. And in fact, they're not the problem. The problem, we've put a face. So in this instance, you've put a face onto your self-righteousness. You're, you're, you're putting the blame elsewhere when it's something inside of you. And it could be people, it can be situations. Or, I don't know, let's say someone's all, always complaining that they've never got any money. They're always, you know, got, I've got, never got any money. And, blah, blah, you know, wee, wee, wee. and then you actually start digging, you realize they're spending all their money really frivolously on, on pointless junk. The problem is not that, that, you know, the world's out to get them. They're the problem. So they're taking that, you know, that I'm not getting paid enough. No, you're, you're mismanaging your funds, right? You, you, the mask or the, the thing you're projecting onto is you not having enough money when the real issue is that you're mismanaging what you've got. Uh, does that make sense? The longer this goes undealt with, the face of our problem will either change or more faces to blame will be added. So what we'll do, like, how can I put this? We'll, you'll keep projecting onto something or someone every single time. Or you'll just start adding more and more. So rather, than, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. Quite often we don't deal with matters of offence, i.e. bitter roots, because it's matters of offence really that become the bitter roots, because we've already constructed our reality based off our thoughts and emotions. We think, well, I don't need to do that because I know I'm right. Because we've built our own reality, that's all based off emotion, offence, not going to the person, we don't deal with it. I already know I'm right. Don't you know they did this? 
sometimes we don't bring our offense to people because we're afraid of confronting it. Again, I believe there's something in the back of our mind that doesn't, just in case you might be the issue rather than the other person. By the way, what I'm going through right now, this is why we have so much division in the body. The enemy is not having to do an awful lot. Right? We blame the enemy and the demons for all the, all the stuff that's going on in the body. Look at this, look at that. And it's like, let's start looking at the problem, the root of the problem. We, we, we're actually, because we're not dealing with this stuff, we're giving the enemy fodder. Quite often, we've made a movie in our mind of how things will play out. And these movies, are li they're not based in reality. They're not based in reality. Again, Judas had all sorts of stuff going on in his mind. Well, what about this? And why is he doing that? And uh, he, he can't be the Messiah. He built this whole movie. Just because you're offended doesn't mean that you're right in your offense. And again, this is why Yeshua says, if you're offended, if, there's, if you have a problem, you go to your brother. How many of us have been offended by something or someone? We've gone to them and we've had the details filled in and all of a sudden we feel like an idiot and we, we have to apologize to the person. Oh, do you see what I mean? The result is that all our actions and decisions are based on fear, on emotion, and they're based on fiction because none of it is true. It's all up here. It's all up here. Why did Judas do what he did? All his actions were driven by his emotions. He was offended. He was hurt. And it was all based on fiction. None of it was true. Had he just gone to Yeshua and said, look, I'm really struggling with what you're talking about, about this crucifixion business. Can you just help me out a little? But none of them did. None of them did. We begin to judge and label people according to these things. So we, we, build, we build our paradigms, we build our little realities. And then when people don't match our expectations and our realities, we judge them. This is what I mean by having our own standard of righteousness. We've been given a standard of righteousness. It's called the Torah. But there, uh, there's many things that we consider um, unrighteous look cultural differences right in france you 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 kiss on you know where i came from you kissed one two three right depending what area you're in you have different amounts now imagine doing that to i don't know like a japanese person that's very old school right that where you respect personal space do you see what i mean the japanese person could quite easily go oh what are you doing and be really offended you're a heathen it's like, no, we just do. But is any of it is personal space and greeting a Torah principle? No. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? We've got to be very careful to say, well, this is right and this is wrong. When it's not in scripture. I mean, should we respect people's cultural differences? Sure. But I hope people will see what I'm trying to get at here. And this causes us to fall into Lashon Hara. Ultimately. Ultimately. All because we didn't deal with it right at the start. And the longer we leave it, the harder it is to deal. It's like weeds in the garden. If you don't deal with them right at the root all the time, they spread, the hard. I'm, I'm figuring this out now in the real world. <laughs> this then leads to division, whether it's factions occurring or self removal from a group of situation. And this is what Judas did, he removed himself. He says, screw you guys, I've had enough. I'm exposing him. And the whole time he was in the wrong. That's probably the best thing to occur for the person to remove themselves or for leadership say to remove them. What becomes the problem is when factions start occurring. Yah hates it. It's seen the seven things he hates. Ultimately, these things then remain under the surface and undealt with. And then they're left to wreak havoc in our minds and lives. Because we never dealt with it. We've removed ourselves from the situation. And on and round and round the tree we go. Who, who, we've all met people that go from fellowship to fellowship to fellowship to fellowship to fellowship, but they're not the problem, right? <laughs> we've all met people like that. 
Why? It's because they're not dealing with the leaven. They're not dealing with these bitter roots. They're doing a Judas. So let's actually start looking. So this was the battleground of the mind. I want to actually start looking now at what the remedy is. Let's start talking practical. Let's, you know, Michael, you've gone on and on about all the bad stuff. What now? So let's start looking at this. Romans 12. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. So this is what's expected of it. A set apart, well-pleasing sacrifice. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Again, where does it all start? Up here. Where was the enemy trying to get through to Yeshua when Yeshua was tempting him? He was playing on all the things that are inside of him right are you the son of elohim well do this notice it says do not be conformed to this world we know what is worldly what isn't right we have a again a standard of righteousness that defines this for i say through the favor which has been given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think but to think soberly as elohim has given to each a measure of belief <clears throat> Do you think that maybe when you have all your theological ducks in a row and you know you're right, do you think you may be thinking of yourself a little more highly than you ought to? Look, there's no problem with knowing that you may be right. Look, do not murder. Do not murder. We, I know that murdering people is a sin, right? I'm not talk, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, again, stuff like Anton's theology in there. But look, Paul is saying, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not by naming it and claiming it and saying, I bind you, Satan. I demand the blessing to come. I demand for wisdom and discernment. <laughs> no, a transformation of the mind. It's funny as well because the mind is one of the, it's the only thing that man cannot change. It forces you to depend on Elohim. It forces you to depend on Elohim. Philippians 2. Before we get to that, I want you to notice transformation of the mind and not thinking of yourself more highly. So humility, humility. Philippians 2. For let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Again, humility, subjection, and came to be in the likeness of men. And having been found in, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, death even of a stake. Look, did Yeshua ever lose the battleground of the mind? No, he didn't. So why wouldn't we want that mind of Messiah? Elohim therefore has highly exalted him and given him the name above, which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Yeshua Messiah is master to the esteem of Elohim the Father. So that, my beloved, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now, much rather in my absence, work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling. For it is Elohim who is working in you, both the desire and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I want to link verse 13 to everything we've covered thus far in spiritual warfare. Who was, when Elisha pleaded Elohim to strike the nation blind, who struck the nation blind? It was Yah, right? When is it our own authority? No, it's not. It's his authority. So it's Elohim who is working in us. He's working through us, hopefully, to do these things. And notice that it's to do for his good pleasure. His will, not yours. 
And there comes in the, the um, when you are usurping the throne, you are not doing his good pleasure. When you're taking matters into your own hands, contrary to his will, it's not him working in you and it's not his will being enacted. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? And again, this is all preceded by let this mind be in you. The mind of a servant, not my will, but yours. You have to remember that back then, a, a bond servant, a bond slave, okay, would have been the, 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 the terminology. It was always the master's desire first. You, 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 you would wait for the master to eat and then you would eat. Do we do that? Do we put him first in all things? You know, if we get that mind, look, how do we renew our mind? We have the Ruach. It's what we put into it. What's the spiritual food we eat? But I would say that discipleship is a key, key element in this. Sometimes it takes someone outside of the box to go, dude, right there. You need to sort this out. Let's look at Jeremiah 17. The heart is crooked above all and desperately sick. Who shall know it? I ask such the heart and I try the kidneys and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. In the Hebraic thinking, the heart is the mind and essence of the man, of man. So when, when Paul is saying, be transformed by the renewing of the mind. You can, you can think of this as the renewing of the heart. Oh, that sounds very familiar. Maybe to a renewed covenant. We need to renew our heart. We need to renew our mind. What is it that renews it? Oh, it's his spirit. We quote this verse all the time, but few truly know it. When it's saying your heart, he's saying... Your mind is desperately sick. Your mind, your desires. Remember that from the heart comes all, we'll get there. People are afraid to truly admit the depravity of their fallen nature. I mean, look, it's really hard to have to truly face yourself. Because we like to think, oh, well, I, I've been doing this, you know, tick, I've kept the Sabbath, tick. I'm here listening to the, to the word being preached and tick, well, I'm here on this Moedim, tick. Do you see what I'm getting at? Even though we do all these things, we've still got things in our mind that probably shouldn't be there. As we're probably all figuring out over this Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? <laughs> Genesis 8, 21, and Yah smelled a soothing fragrance, and Yah said in his heart, never again shall I curse the ground because of man, although the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. He's saying this after the flood. So don't tell me, oh, well, Yah was on about all the people be before the flood. The, the, with the people before their flood, their heart was continually on evil. evil. Yah is just saying that that man's heart naturally inclines to evil. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely is delivered. Again, remember, what's the heart? The mind. In Hebraic thought, the heart and the mind were the same thing. He who trusts in his own mind? Ooh. Certainly changes it. Look. The inclination of a man's mind is evil from his youth. These are not just glib statements, right? We quote this all the time. Oh, the heart is desperately sick. The reality of them is truly sobering. And it's, it's a little scary. It's a little scary. And I'm with you on that. I get it. Only when you've truly faced your fallen nature Will you truly realize the depths of Elohim's mercy and compassion? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'll say that again. Only once you've truly faced you, and I mean really seeing you for what you truly are, only then can you even begin to understand Elohim's mercy and compassion. I used to say it all the time, Elohim is merciful, he's compassionate. Da, da, da. You only understand that when you've had to receive it. 
And the only way, you, remember that mercy and compassion is given to those who don't deserve it. That's the whole point. That's why it's called mercy. You don't deserve it, but you're giving it anyway. The problem is, look, we have to not fall into self-condemnation when we get to this place of truly realizing it. It's okay. But what's the first stage of rectifying a problem is to admit it, is to make that problem known. And I don't mean to the, everybody. I mean, you've got to know that. And again, this is what this whole season of Unleavened Bread is for. Getting rid of that stuff facing you. Proverbs 3, trust in Yah with all your heart, with all your mind, and lean not on your own understanding. Notice, he's, just, he's saying, trust on Yah, not on your own understanding. This is, this is like, again, showing the heart and mind and understanding are all intertwined. Your heart cannot be trusted, your mind, but Elohim can. This is why he's saying, trust in Yah. This is why we need to renew our mind to the image of Messiah. So then we actually can start trusting in our mind because it's not really our mind, it's his mind in us. As our hearts become purer, the more trustworthy we become and thus we become better vessels for him. Look at what Peter had to go through to become the apostle that he was. He was He was curing people that were lame from birth that was real spiritual power it wasn't his it was the messiah's but again what did he have to go through he had to face himself he had to face himself the converse results in us being vessels of dishonor and vessels of hasatan if we don't let, if we don't purify our mind, if we don't deal with our leaven and our heart, we become vessels for the adversary, just like Judas. We see through a glass dimly, but Elohim sees all things, past, present, and future, which is why we need to trust in Yah with all our heart, mind, soul, strength. You know what I mean? Don't lean on your own understanding. Why? Because it leans towards evil and is very, very subtle, very subtle. You know, this is where you have to start. When you start realizing what's truly driving your actions and driving your decisions and driving your judgments of people. Know him in all your ways and he makes all your paths straight. What did Paul have that the Jewish exorcists didn't? We covered this last week, uh, last teaching. Paul had an intimate relationship with the Messiah. What was it? all John 17? We, we expounded on John 17 that he wants, Yeshua wants us to know him, to know the Father, and to know that he came forth from the Father, that all authority has been subjected. He, want, he wants us to know that. Do we know him or do we know about him? Because I've got several scriptures here. I can learn lots about Elohim. Do I know him? Do I know his character? Notice that knowing him, that's what makes all your paths straight, that he does it. Only then. It's a conditional here. It's a conditional statement. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear ye and turn away from evil. Again, the theme of humility. And notice that Job was a man who feared Yah and turned away from evil. And that's what resulted in him being protected. He was protected. The adversary couldn't touch him. Why? Because he had this. He feared Yah, not the boogeyman. And he turned away from evil. But it turns out Job had a little bit of this going on. He was maybe a little wise in his own eyes. Something had to be sifted out of him. Humility allows room for servitude and obedience. You cannot serve and obey if you're not humble. Not properly, do you know what I mean? 
I hope that makes sense. If you're truly humble, because remember, what did we read in Philippians 2? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who became, and he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death. Do you think he trusted in Yah with all his heart and strength? Absolutely. It's the only thing that probably got him to, to walk, in, uh, to allow himself to be arrested, to allow himself to be crucified. He trusted in Yah with all his heart. Thus, humility results in us respecting spiritual authority structure and not taking matters into our own hands and usurping his will and throne. Because if you're not humble, if you've not got this servant attitude, the natural thing you're going to do is usurp that leadership that, or that authority that's over you. You're not going to respect it. What did Judas do? His leaven, whatever he was going on, it caused him to turn against Messiah, the one over him. And Judas took matters into his own hands. Remembering, so okay, remembering that the heart and mind are one and the same in Hebraic thought. But now that we know this, let's look at Romans 8. I love this passage. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds or their hearts onto the matters of the flesh. For those who live according to the spirit, matters of the spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Now, knowing that the mind and the heart are interchangeable, oh, the heart of the spirit is life. Again, this is renewed covenant talk. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim, neither indeed is it able. And those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim, which means that the converse is true. This means that the mind of the flesh does subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Now notice, the mind, the heart of the spirit, subjects itself to the Torah. Again, it's... There's humility, there's servitude in that, but renewed covenant talk. You've got all the three things, the heart, the spirit, and the Torah, all in one. Notice the theme of subjection. Subjection. I hope this is making sense. I believe this also applies to individuals, Torah. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Yah will tell some things to some people that are not written in Torah. So, for example, he told Joshua, go around Jericho once a day and for six days. And on the seventh day, you go around seven times. J Joshua could have gone, sorry, mate, I've got the Torah. <laughs> do you see what I'm trying to get at? Like, Yah will command to you to do something in your life. And I believe that this also applies to that. Torah just means instruction, and he might instruct you to do something. Does that make sense? If you deny that, if you, if you do not subject yourself to it, you, you're actually having the heart or the mind of the flesh. First John 2. Do not love the world, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world passes away in the lust of it, but the one doing the desire of Elohim remains forever. I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier that these are the only ways the enemy can get to you through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All temptations and sin, when you trace it back, will fall back on one of those things, right? Where do all these things begin? Do they begin with the demons? Do they begin with Hasatan? No, they begin with you. They begin with your mind. They begin with your heart. I hope this is... This is really critical in understanding this. If you want spiritual victory, right? True, you want to win the spiritual battle, renew your mind. Because if you renew your mind and heart, you won't subject 
to the lust of the flesh. You won't subject to the lust of the eyes. You won't subject to the pride of life. And by the way, the pride of life, that's the kicker. That's the one that we suffer with the most. When, again, our minds, our hearts naturally incline towards evil. Okay, let's continue with some practical application. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings. Where do you reason? In your mind, in your heart. And every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, i.e. the Torah, taking captive every thought, make it obedient to Messiah. Funny, Paul hasn't once mentioned Use your authority as a priest and a king and bind up all the demons. He's saying, no, the weapons we fight with are to take captive every thought in Messiah. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Again, humility, subjection to the will of the Father. Elohim asks you to do something, you do it. And you, if you have any problems in your heart, take it to the person or to, to Elohim. Do you see what I'm trying to get hold? But notice the very weapons we fight with. I don't see anything to do with authority in it. I don't see anything to do with binding Satan and attacking the devil. All of this is up here. Why do you obey? Because you're humble. Where does humility begin? In the heart and in the mind. These are the weapons we fight with. What is it that helps us change our heart, that tells us what is the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The word of Elohim. I hope people are really getting this. Where do reasonings come from? Again, I said it, from the mind and the heart. Don't take my word for it. Take Yeshua's words for it. In Mark 7.20, and he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, or out of the mind of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thirst, greedy desires, wickedness, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, pride, ooh, maybe pride of life, foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. Now, Look, he's, Messiah is telling you, it's from your heart, it's from your mind that all this stuff comes with. And let's go back to what Paul said. The weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings. Where, what, these are the reasonings, reasonings that Yeshua is on about that create murders, adulteries, evil inclination. And again, look, oh, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Messiah. I've said this before, an affair just doesn't happen overnight. You don't just land in another person's bed. It starts with a thought. It starts with an attraction and it builds up. And what do you do? You don't take that thought captive. You allow emotions to start d doing all this stuff. And what happens? The person starts looking at their spouse and comparing them to the person that they're lusting over. They're building a whole movie. And then every action they do is based upon this movie. Why do you think marriages are destroyed this way? I hope people can see that. It's not some demon going around, oh, you're going to sleep with that person. No, it's you. You're not overthrowing the reasonings. You're not taking captive every thought. You know, let's use murder as well. Why would you, let's talk physical murder, like cold-hearted planned murder. You don't go, oh, I feel like killing you. Right, most normal people, and that's what I'm talking about. No, it starts off with something, usually with offense. They did something, or they've got something you want, and you don't deal with it, and it ends up manifesting. Do you see what I'm talking about? There's no demon going, go murder that person. Ephesians 6. For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. Not your strength, 
You're not to bind. You're not to do this. It's his strength. It's his authority. Put on the complete armor of Elohim. Not some of it. Not picking and choosing which bits you like. The complete armor of Elohim. For you to have power to, oh, not attack. No, for the power to stand against the schemes of the devil. The armor of Elohim. Look, what's an armor? It's a defensive thing. It's to protect you. Paul is saying for you to have power to stand, not to go out and attack. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand again this is all defensive speak none of this is you go out on the offense and storm the demons and the gates of hell on the contrary stand again did did you show the apostles go and storm out and start casting drum no that they were going about the will of the father going about the will of the kingdom and when the demons came to them, they stood. I hope this makes sense. Stand. Not run forward or charge. Stand. Then having girded your waist with truth. What is truth? The word is truth. Yeshua is truth. His, not only that, his words are everlasting truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What defines righteousness? Oh, truth. Torah, his word, his ways. Having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. So I've put here Hebrews 4.2. For indeed the good news was brought to us as well as to them. This is speaking of the, those in the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not having been mixed with belief in those who heard it. Go read the end of Hebrews 3 and the rest of Hebrews 4. But it's basically saying that they didn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief, which was equated to disobedience. And they're saying, Paul, you know, the writer of Hebrews is saying the good news was brought to us as well as to them. What was that good news? Go read Exodus 19, 5 and 6. If you obey my commands, if you submit, then you shall be my treasured possession and a kingdom of priests and kings. If you submit, that's repentance right there. But again, what was the good news they heard? Uh, it, it, it's built and the foundation is if you obey. So can you see how truth, righteousness, good news, it's all related to his ways, to his word. Above all, having taken up the shield of belief, of faith, with which you shall have power to quench all the burning arrows of the wicked one. What are the burning arrows of the wicked one? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. They're the only three things he's got, but he, he repackages it. He repackages it. Luke 18, 8, but when the son of Adam comes, shall he find the belief on the earth? The true faith. The true faith. Notice again, the shield of belief. What, what do we need? We need the word. Our true belief needs to be founded on the word and on the word made flesh. Remember, it's the prayer of the belief that James speaks of. Well, we covered this. I can't remember which part. But that is the prayer of a righteous one. Again, so do you think maybe he's got the breastplate of righteousness? If he's got the breastplate of righteousness, that means he's girded with truth. Because he knows what righteousness is. It's the prayer of that belief that heals the sick. And remember, it's not the person doing it. It's the person entreating the king, the one with the authority. 
Take also the helmet of deliverance and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim, the complete word of Elohim. Notice that Paul says, put on the complete armor of Elohim. And if all the armor is based off the word, let me get there, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. You need all of it, not picking and choosing what bits you like. And not only that, you need to have a leaven free understanding of it. Praying at all times with prayer, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the set apart ones. Look, what is this? People think that praying in the spirit, oh, there's all sorts of interpretations, whether it's speaking in tongues or whether it's kind of being in this airy fairy ethereal state, being a spiritual antenna. Like, oh, what is the spirit? Re remember what we covered. The mind of the spirit subjects itself to the Torah. Yeshua said that my words are spirit and are life. So what does it mean to pray and supplicate in the spirit? In, in the word. In accordance to the word. Your prayers shouldn't be... Right, Yah's not going to answer a prayer if you're asking to sin. Do you see what I'm saying? That's not praying it in the spirit. Anyway. <clears throat> Romans 13. Owe no one any matter except to love one another. For he who loves another has filled the Torah. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other command, it is summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What did Yeshua say just a minute ago that we covered? Where do adulteries and murders and thefts and evil reasonings come from? Coveting, where does it come from? From a wicked heart, a wicked mind. The love, do, love does the new evil to a neighbor therefore love is the completion of the torah and do this knowing that do what owing no man nothing except to fulfill torah paul saying do this do not commit adultery do not murder do not bear false witness do fulfill the torah do this knowing the time that it is already for the hour for us to wake up from sleep for now our deliverance is nearer than when we did believe. The night is far advanced and the day has come near. So let us put off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What is light, scripturally speaking? Go read Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Go read Proverbs 6.23. The word enlightens. What is the armor of light? It's his word. This means that when we sin, we do not have the armor of light on, thus making us vulnerable to spiritual attack. I hope people can see this. Remember, why was Job untouchable? He feared Yah and he turned away from evil. He was in a hedge of protection. The enemy literally could not touch him. By his own admission, the armor of light is based on rightly dividing the word and Torah of Elohim, i.e. without heaven. Right? Remember, you girded with truth, righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the good news. You, th these are all word-based things, right? And we need to be able to have that without leaven. So can you, you see now, look. Peter and Judas, they knew the word. They knew that Yeshua was going to come back as the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. They just didn't know how it was going to occur. That leaven, it tainted their armor. It created a chink in the armor that the enemy went boom. And it all started in the mind. Psalm 34, verse 6. This one cried out, and Yah heard him, and saved him out of all his distresses. The messenger of Yah encamps around all those who fear him and rescue them. Not those who fear Hasatan, 
Not those who fear the demons, not those who fear their situation, those who fear Yah. Oh, taste and see that Yah is good. Blessed is the man that takes refuge in him. Let's look at Daniel. Then the sovereign rose up very early in the morning and hurried to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he called with a grieved voice to Daniel. And the sovereign spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living Allah, has your Allah, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the sovereign, O sovereign, live forever. My Allah has sent his messengers, oh, maybe they were encamping around him, and has shut the lion's mouth, and they did not harm me because I was found innocent before him. And also before you, O sovereign, I have done no harm. Daniel was protected. He was untouchable. Why? Because he fulfilled the two greatest commands. He was found innocent before Elohim and innocent having done no harm to the king. Love Yah your Elohim with all your heart, soul, mind, soul, strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And because of that, the messenger shut the lion's mouth. Do you think, can you see the typology here, guys? All Daniel did was fulfill the two greatest commands. He had no uh, iniquity in him. He had no guile. He, he had integrity. Let's look at Matthew 6. This, then, is the way you should pray. Right, so let's look at practical things. Now, who would have ever thought that the Lord's Prayer could be part of spiritual warfare? Right, someone asked me, well, what do I do? If, I, if all these binding and loosing prayers and all this stuff is wrong, how do I pray? This is the exact same question that the disciples asked him. And Yeshua is saying, this then is the way you should pray. Our Father who is in the heavens, let your name be set apart. What does modern spiritual warfare teach you? To glorify your own name. I bind, I lose, I demand, I decree, I declare. I'm a priest, I'm a king. No. Let his name be set apart. His name, his will. Let your reign come. Not my personal little kingdom that I'm building for myself. No, let your reign come. Let your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my desire, his. This is actually the secret to spiritual warfare. It's one of them. This re let your desire be done. On Michael, what are you talking about? Explain yourself. Stop, being, stop speaking in riddles. Okay. Nothing will stand in the way of his will. Can we agree on that? When Yah wants something, it happens. Always. His word never returns void. Nothing will stand in the way of his will. We need to find out what his will for our lives is and stay in it. Why do you think... Peter and the apostles had the authority they did. Who's, first, it was his authority. Secondly, they had it because there were 11 free vessels. And thirdly, they were going about the king's business. And anything that stood in the way of that will, the will of the throne, well, sorry, you got something coming to you. This is how steadfastness and trust is actually cultivated in our lives. When you know, it takes time to, to realize what his will is for our lives. And we have to pray for that. But when you stay in that will, even if you haven't received a breadcrumb or a word for however long, stay in it. Don't take matters into your own hands because the minute you do, you've stepped out of his will. You know, all of us... Um, for example, we pray, you know, yeah, what should I do in this situation? Should I do this and should I do that? And because we don't hear from him, because we're not given a breadcrumb, we take matters into our own hands. 
I always say to people, well, Yah's not said anything. I says, well, then don't do anything. Because that if he's not giving you where to go, to the left or to the right, you need to stay put. I hope this makes sense. But if you know what his will is for your life, and you stay in that will, it's his design that's done on the earth as it is in heaven. Nothing will stand in front of that. If you're about the king's business, look, when a king sent out an, sent out an envoy, that envoy had the authority of the king, and nothing stood in his way. And if you touched that envoy, you were touching the king. How do you think that went? It came down with force. Can you see the picture, guys? Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need, our hearts need to be right before him. Again, because if we don't forgive, if we're expecting the Father to forgive us and we don't forgive our brothers, guess what we have? Evil reasonings. Evil heart. And do not lead us into trial, but deliver us from the wicked one. Isn't that what we want? To be delivered from the wicked one? Now notice that this is preceded by let your income, let your desire be done. There's not one ounce of self in this. Because yours is the reign, not mine, yours. And the power and the esteem forever, forever. So why is it that modern spiritual warfare teaches you to build your kingdom with the power that you have to build up your reputation and self-esteem and puff up your pride is completely contrary to the pattern given to us by Messiah. But I hope people can see that this prayer, especially in verse 10, this is one of your biggest keys to spiritual warfare. Let your desire be done. Let your will be done. How did Yeshua not lose the battleground of the mind in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, no, not my will be done, your will be done. What did he do? In the, how did he overcome in the, in the wilderness? He, he knew how things would play out. He was being offered a shortcut. And he said, no, not my way, his way. His way is already appointed and I will stick to it. Even if it means I have to lay down my life. And the devil fleed. Then Yeshua came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the taught ones, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Kepha and the two sons of Zavdai, and he began to be grieved and deeply distressed. He's wrestling. He's feeling emotion. Think about this. He's having a battle here. Then he said to them, my being is exceedingly grieved even to death. Stay here with and watch with me. And moving forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I desire, but as you desire. And he came to the taught ones and found them asleep and said to Kepha, So were you not able to watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into trial. The spirit indeed is eager, but the flesh is weak. Yeshua is going through the battle, but he is so focused on the Father that he's not given in. He's saying, not my will, your will. And who's he warning? He's now warning those around him. This is really interesting. If the enemy can't get to the repentant person, he'll try to get to them through those surrounding them. And what do I mean by that? This is what happened in the garden. He couldn't get to Adam. So how did he get to Adam? through his wife he went through the wife to bring the fall into in, into place this is what happened to moshe why did moshe not be allowed into the land because the people brought him to anger and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it you have a you have an amazing typology here it wasn't Moshe, it, it, per se, it wasn't Moshe. It was those around him that caused him to lose it. And he took matters into his own hands. Can you see how critical this is?
Okay. Let's wrap this up. This is going to be a very short summation of everything that we've gone through in these four parts. Elohim is on the throne, and above all beings and things, all things must pass before the throne. Everything. He causes or allows everything to occur. Everything. Doesn't mean he likes everything that goes on, but he allows it. There is no battle between good and evil. Hasatan is subservient to that throne. There is good and evil, but there's no battle between it. I hope that makes sense. Not in the sense of angels versus demons. And blah, blah. There's going to be a battle in Revelation. We read of that, that Michael and his, uh, and his angels will, will uh, have a battle and throw the enemy down. But there's no cosmic chess match, as it were. We need to get rid of this theology. All sifting is designed to bring out things in us that are not of him and therefore to repent of. This is why we get sifted. It exposes things in us. And we can either be like Peter, stay in the battle, wrestle with it, keep in the discipleship, keep in that accountable place and win. Or we can be like Judas, dig our heels in, lose the battleground of our mind, make up our own reality, and we know where that goes. If you are being sifted or attacked spiritually, ask yourself why. Stop freaking out that you are, and ask yourself why. Again, I said in one of the previous parts that it is possible, for example, to be attacked demonically in the dream. Ask yourself why. What's inside of you that's allowed, that's giving legal ground? Remember, if you are perfectly in the will of Yah and you fear Him and you turn away from evil, there's a hedge around you. So if something's getting to you, ask yourself, what is it? Elohim instituted the office of adversary and it is above you in authority. Remember what the authority structure was Elohim the angelic host and Hasatan, and then mankind. He, Elohim designed the office of adversary for sifting. And last time I checked, everything that Elohim creates does its job, and it does it perfectly. It's designed to sift you, and there's only one way to overcome it. Get off the throne of your own life, of your own heart. True spiritual authority comes from the throne. You do not have any of your own. He just, either you're trusted with his authority or you're not. That's what it boils down to. You don't have that authority, but he chooses, that he favours whom he favours, right? Having true authority is linked to being in repentance, humility, selflessness, and being leaven free. I hope that makes sense. More of him is less of us, not less of us is more of him. I'm stealing this from Curtis. And it's so true. We think that to have more of Elohim in us, we need to get rid of us, if that makes sense. And it's like, no, we need to fill ourselves with him. And the natural thing that will happen is that the more we of him we take, the less the flesh gets in the way. If that makes again, this is about focusing on him. What does spiritual modern spiritual warfare teaching give you? Focus on the darkness, focus on the demons, focus on what the Illuminati are doing, focus on what the you know Project MK Ultra is doing. Build your theology off this. It's like no. More focus on him. Focus on him. Yeshua has already overcome death and has the keys to Sheol. Therefore, we don't need to storm the gates of hell. He's already got the keys. Binding and loosing has to do with leadership exercising authority within the body of Messiah. Righteous authority. We covered this in part two. It's got nothing to do with binding demons and that nonsense. Modern spiritual warfare teachings are based in witchcraft, spellcasting, and occult ideology. Again, 
Watch part two. Modern spiritual warfare teaches that spiritual authority comes from self. And it also teaches you to usurp the throne of Elohim and to speak evil of esteemed ones. Go watch part three, where we go through the account of Jude. Even Michael the archangel did not bring one accusation against Hasatan, but said, yeah, I rebuke you. Because he knew that he's not to speak evil of esteemed ones. It teaches, modern spiritual warfare teaching teaches us to do the very thing we're not supposed to do. And then we wonder why people that partake in this stuff have got so much chaos in their life. It teaches you not to take accountability for your own actions. <clears throat> and it's at the expense of repentance and intimacy with Messiah. All right? It teaches you that the demons are the problem. Hasatan is the problem. And um, as we've gone through, especially today, it comes from a wicked heart. This is what's in us. That's what gives the, the enemy ammo. If you've overcome the lust of, remember the three arrows, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. That all begins in your mind and in your heart. If you fully get that under control and subjected to Messiah, the enemy can throw any one of those three darts at you and it won't touch you. It also teaches you that um, no repentance, right? All you do is say the magic prayer, get a dip in some water, and now you're a warrior. You have all this authority. And you do, it does it at the expense of intimacy with Messiah. And we did this in part three. It completely omits the fact that spiritual warfare begins in the mind. Right? In the Christian mindset, spiritual warfare is all external in the spiritual realm. And we just read today, Paul said that the weapons we fight with, they're all to do with this. It admits that you need to be leaven free to be a vessel for him. Apparently, it doesn't matter what you do and what doctrine you believe, just say in the name of Jesus, plead it under the blood, boom. It teaches you that spiritual warfare is on the offensive as opposed to the defensive. Again, what did Paul say? Stand, stand, withstand, stand. Again, this is exactly what the apostles and Yeshua did. They went about the will of the Father, and when it came to them, they stood and they overcame. The more conformed we are to the image of Messiah, the better vessel we can be for Elohim. Why do you think Yeshua had such authority? Right? True spiritual authority is the outcome of knowing the king and being about his will and his business. I think we did this in part three. True spiritual authority is an outcome. We don't, like, again, we don't go to spiritual warfare boot camp. We don't flex our spiritual warfare muscles. That's something that uh, they'll teach you, that, you know, you babble away in this tongue, and it builds up your spiritual muscles. It's like, no. True spiritual authority is the outcome of being level free and being about his business. True spiritual authority will come at a great price. Being level free comes with crushing. It comes with fire. It comes with having to look at yourself. It comes at a great price. Many of us have paid a great price to be on the journey we're on now. We are to fear and focus on Elohim, not the darkness. It doesn't say it's truly a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the adversary. It says we are, it's truly a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Let's fear the one with the authority. This is literally what this ultimately boils down to. Let me really reduce this to simple statements. When the time and situation arises, 
can you be a trustworthy vessel of his will? Can he trust you with his authority and power? Can he trust you not to get puffed up and steal his glory, right? Will you have his authority in the moment? Will you truly have that authority in the moment? When you're going about the will of the king, will he be there to back you up? Can he trust you not to steal his glory? So what do we do now? What do we do? Someone actually asked me, how shall I pray? Everything I did was wrong. And this person was distressed, right? They had that crippling conviction. And I could almost sense a, a bit of self-condemnation in there. So what should I do? How shall I pray? Well, we covered this, right? Yeshua says, this then is the way you should pray. First of all, don't condemn yourself for what you have or haven't done, right? We fall into this space of self-condemnation because we realize that what we've been doing is wrong, to put it nicely. Look, the fact that you've realized it's wrong, who do you think showed you that? It was Yah that pulled the blinders off your eyes. So he's the one that's showing you that. So don't, do you know what I mean? Don't get all, all, all self-pitiful and self-condemning because there's a reason why he's showing you that. The, the only reason he's showing you that is so that you can repent and draw closer to him, which means that he's showing you that because he loves you. He cares about you and wants you nearer to him. What we ought to do can be summed up with two scriptures, literally two passages. I could, if I was to reduce spiritual warfare down to like a bite size, do you know what I mean? Philippians 2.13, work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling, for it is Elohim who is working in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Don't work out other people's salvation. Don't work yours. Right? I'm not called to deleaven you lot. I'm not called to deleaven those are coming. I'm called to get the leaven out of my own heart. And those that I choose to walk in discipleship, we help one another, but ultimately it's down to the individual. Work out your own deliverance so that you can be a fit vessel, so that you can be leaven free, so that he can trust you, right? For it is Elohim who is working in you. Once we work out our own deliverance, our own salvation, our own ability to be a vessel then it's elohim who's working in us why to do his good pleasure again not my will not my kingdom not my power yas to him belongs all the glory this is the other passage this then is the way you should pray our father who is in the heavens let your name be set apart let your reign come let your desire be done on the earth as it is in heaven. If you truly stand in his will, nothing can touch you because it's his will. Look, let me share. There's certain things that Yah has told me is going to occur in my life. And, and that means that until those things happen, here I am. Nothing, as long as I stay in his will, which right now is to do what I do now, to feed the body, to feed into discipleship, to help raise people, to grow people. As long as I stay in that, nothing can touch me. And I don't say that arrogantly. Do you know what I mean? I'm not like Paul or Peter. I, do you know what I mean? I've, I've never healed someone with my prayer that I'm aware of. Do you know what I mean? I've not caused the lame to walk. But I know that as long as I stick in his will, nothing can touch me. Those 10,000 on one side and 1,000 on the other, as long as I stay in his will, let your will be done. Do you, I hope people really see what I'm trying to say. Surely it's not that simple. It can't be. It can't be that simple. I think it really is. 
Are you annoyed that I've taken away your Hollywood idea of being a warrior? Is this, could this be why you've got this knee jerk reaction? This is when you, this, this starts being the motive behind the, the reaction now. Oh, it's not that simple. People will dress it up like, well, scripture said this and scripture says that. And it's like, hang on. It, it, am I taking away your preconceived idea? Am I taking away what puffs you up? What gives, what gives you self-worth? Is that the real reason? It's not that simple. Second Corinthians 11, 3, but I'm afraid lest as the serpent deceived Harvard by his trickery, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Messiah. It's the enemy that complicates things. It's man that complicates things. Is it really this simple? Is there really simplicity in Messiah? If he's truly on the throne and I stay in his will, it's not, it's not me people are coming against, it's the king's will. Is it literally that simple? All we have to do is make sure we are a vessel fit for purpose. And that all that entails, okay? I, there's a lot of things summed up in that statement. Leaven free, submissive, right? selfless everything we've gone through so far that's a, that's that could be a whole teaching series right there being a vessel of yeah all we have to do is make sure we are a vessel fit for purpose all we have to do is make sure we are on the path and moving forward on that path that doesn't mean be perfect right it says have integrity and repent as you go along as more and more is shown to you it's a journey right it was Peter magically sinless once he was entrusted with with the the um, with raising the early Kahal. No, but I can guarantee you he repented as he went along. And this is what Paul speaks of saying that we go from glory to glory. Right? We don't go poof. I'm glory. I'm glorious now. No, we move from glory to glory. Go about his business and his will, not ours. Once, you, once you're the vessel, subject yourself. Be obedient unto the master. Let this mind be in you like it was in your shirt. Go about his business, his will, not yours, and watch him take care of the rest. Watch him take care of the rest. Is it literally that simple? Do we truly believe he is on the throne? Because if you truly believe that, I mean truly, know it intrinsically in your heart, that it's in every fiber of your body, and then you know that you're doing the king's will, what do you think will happen to anything, anyone or any spiritual entity that tries to come against that? Is it literally that simple? I hope that's been a blessing, guys. In fact, I just want to finish with this verse. But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Chava by his trickery, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Messiah. Our faith is simple, but it is deep. It's simple, but it's powerful. Amen.